Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here to speak at this conference, and thank you very much, Audrey, for uh, the introduction. I'm delighted to be here talking about Slauncher Care, the government's health reform uh, programme. Uh, and as Audrey mentioned, myself and Paul Reid, the CEO of the HSC, are co-chair of the implementation board. So we're charged, along with our colleagues, both in the Department of Health and the HSC, to implement what is a very comprehensive uh, reform programme across many different dimensions and many different domains within uh, our health system. And given the nature of this uh, reform programme, I guess there's always healthy debate about the pace of reform, the implementation, what's been achieved, uh, what's left to be achieved. And what I hope to talk about this morning are many things that we've done uh, and setting out what we're hoping to achieve this year and next year and setting out the roadmap for implementation of this very ambitious uh, reform plan. So I have a few slides as ever, just to very briefly talk about uh, the context for Slauncha Care. I guess uh, we have a system which is set up to deal with different demographics, different health needs of our population. Uh, and over the next number of years, we're undertaking very significant demographic change. Population is growing. Uh, the population uh, over 65 will be well over a million by 2028. And the number of people over 80 will also increase significantly. So our health system needs to adapt uh, to this, thankfully, uh, very significant improvement in life expectancy. But that creates challenges in terms of people living uh, with multiple conditions, comorbidity, and dealing with chronic uh, diseases, which hopefully we can manage uh, to ensure that people have uh, a reasonable quality of life while, while dealing with these conditions. So the context uh, for healthcare is that the system is under enormous pressure, uh, significant demands, and those demands will only increase over time uh, as demography, as demographic change uh, continues, uh, and as thankfully we're able to treat more and more conditions and enable people to live uh, longer and more fuller lives. Uh, in terms of uh, just some numbers, uh, in terms of the likely demand, and this is based on a health capacity review for 2018 uh, that, that was undertaken for the Department of Health, and we just looked at sort of patterns of demand in the system linked to demographic structure and how that demographic structure over time will lead to an increase in the demand. And as you can see on the graphic, very significant uh, increases in day case activity, non-elective inpatient uh, activity, GPs, uh, number of, of, of people looking for home care packages, nursing home places, GP visits and so on. So sort of the, the general matrix one would use when thinking about the healthcare system and the demand uh, that's placed on it. And this in the context of very significant activity already. Uh, we have, uh, for example, each week around 25, 26,000 people who would turn up at emergency departments. Uh, this year, uh, there'll be one and a half million additional people coming on uh, looking for uh, an outpatient consultation or a day case procedure or an inpatient procedure. Uh, so very significant demand on the system as it exists at present. Uh, and given the demographic changes and given the improvements in technology and so on, we would see very significant increase in demand. And I guess the challenge is how do we reform the system uh, to mitigate, reduce some of this demand, to manage it in a, in a different way, in a more appropriate setting uh, for people and, and ensure that we can are in a position to meet people's uh, health needs. And that really is, I guess, the motivation for Slauncher Care and the great challenge we face in terms of the healthcare system. So uh, I know people in this, in this call, in this conference will, will know what the reform program is about, will have a good sense of what we're trying to achieve. But it, it, as I said at the outset, it involves many different elements and many different uh, dimensions. First of all, of course, is to promote health and well-being and to prevent illness. And a very significant program is based on on encouraging people to live healthier lifestyles, more sustainable lifestyles. And there's a variety of initiatives there uh, within the Healthy Ireland programme which aim to, to, to encourage people to live, live, live healthy and people be aware of the various initiatives. I think a second element is to enhance community care and capacity. Uh, historically, care in Ireland was provided in an acute hospital setting. Uh, and the trend, of course, internationally and the objective here in our policy is to move that to the left so that we enhance care and that more people are treated uh, at home or nearer home in GP settings uh, or a community settings. And I'll talk in a moment about some of the matrix there in terms of uh, the number of people, uh, the number of, of, of primary care centres, uh, community health hubs have been established and so on, which aims to increase the capacity of the system at community level and prevents people from uh, ending up in the acute system or ensuring they can be discharged from the acute system quickly and be cared closer to their home. So that's a key element of, of, of the plan, as people will be aware. Thirdly is around improving hospital capacity, productivity and capacity, and that relates to the numbers of people within the system. 
It relates to the physical infrastructure, uh, e-initiatives, staffing, and so on. Uh, and the last number of years, uh, last year in 2021, uh, we recruited uh, into the system around 6,000 people, between five and 6,000 people, which was the second highest uh, increase in the number of people in the, in the HSC on record. Uh, and the previous year, 2020, was the highest. So over the last two years, we've managed to increase the number of people uh, by about, by about 12,000, around, around 10%, the fastest level of recruitment in each of those two years in the history of, of the HSC. There's also been a very significant increase in the number of, of beds, the number of uh, acute beds and ICU beds, and that's a key element of enhancing capacity because we're aware that at times when the system is under pressure, uh, procedures have to be cancelled, operations have to be cancelled because of lack of, of bed capacity. So increasing the capacity of the system is, is, is really critical, um, which has been achieved over the last two years, and there are plans to, to enhance it again uh, this year uh, and going forward. And fourthly then, uh, it's on the basis of integrating care between various settings. And this, and as the previous speaker alluded to, this is a key challenge in terms of health systems to integrate the different elements of care between GP, community, and acute, so that pe people have a seamless experience, but that they're treated in the correct setting. And the, the establishment of the regional health areas, which we're working on now, hoping to start implementation this year, will have a, will have a, will have a positive impact on that. And second, second last, penultimate point is in relation to provide care on the basis of need, not ability to pay. And that's in relation to the public system, so that people are treated based on, on need, uh, not their ability to pay, and that over time, uh, uh, private patients are no longer treated within the, the, the public health setting. And that involves uh, issues for the financing of the, of the hospital system, is issues for the health insurance market, but also raises questions about the consultant contract uh, and the existing Type B contracts that many consultants hold. So a really significant issue there uh, in relation to uh, providing care based on need and that ability to pay. And then finally then, a key aspect of, of standard care and a key objective is to reduce waiting lists. Waiting lists are too, are too long. We have the, the longest waiting lists uh, across Europe. At the moment, we have almost 80,000 people who are waiting uh, for a day case or inpatient. We have over 600,000 people who are waiting uh, for a consultation. And as I mentioned at the outset, uh, this year alone, we will have almost one and a half new people, one and a half million new people who will be looking for care, whether it's a consultation or who will be looking uh, for a procedure. So to stand still involves very significant uh, activity. Uh, and of course, the challenge uh, for government is to increase activity within the public system, but access the private system and overall uh, increase the level of, of, of access that people can have uh, to consultation or to procedures as necessary. So a very significant, very significant agenda. I think it's useful to reflect upon the extent to which, and the previous speaker touched on this, the extent to which uh, COVID demonstrated the benefits of a universal system, but also highlighted the benefits of, of e-initiatives, of using data uh, uh, in, a, in a more integrated way, a cleverer way, uh, or access to, to, for example, GK Community Diagnostics. So I put on the slide here just a number of, of issues which I think have been really interesting during, during COVID how we could operate in a different way and work in a different way in order to provide uh, healthcare to people uh, in a setting which suits them, or to operate the administration of the system in a way which is more efficient. Uh, I'll just touch on a few of these points. 135,000 GP community diagnostics. So a, a significant challenge in the system has always been for GPs to access diagnostics. So we put in place uh, initiatives to ensure that these diagnostics are now available in the community and GPs can access the diagnostics on behalf of their patients in a more efficient way. This has freed up significant capacity and enabled GPs then to give an informed view to their patients about their condition uh, based on, on faster access to community diagnostics. And we're hoping to build on, uh, on, this, on this initiative for this year and for this to be a permanent uh, feature of our system. Uh, the use of, of, of e-transactions or e-activity, and I just give one example there in relation to the electronic scripts, uh, 14 million uh, issued a very significant improvement in the relationship between GPs and the pharmacy sector. Virtual consultations. So over 330,000 people had a consultation with a GP or a consultant or other healthcare practitioner uh, virtually. I think this really shows the benefit of the technology and the capacity there is for people to have that consultation, to have that engagement in a format that suits them and much more efficient than turning up at a GP surgery or a hospital uh, and doing the traditional way. So again, there's great opportunities to extend this to ensure that people can get access to, to that consultation uh, as, quickly, as quickly as possible. So Solange Care, I think, has demonstrated uh, during COVID, the various initiatives can be accelerated. 
and, and constraints or blockages in the past that may have existed can be overcome when we're in a crisis situation. So when we're now looking at addressing the more structural problems within the health system, particularly in relation to waiting lists, we need to have that same level of reform, that same level of zeal and galvanise the system to address those, those issues. Uh, and these, these sort of initiatives, we need to hold on to them and the ways in which people have changed work practices uh, in incredibly difficult circumstances, but change work practices in order to sustain the system under enormous pressure, I think, is great credit to people who work uh, within the system and shows the opportunity uh, for reform and change into the future as we, we aim to meet uh, the needs, the health needs of our population. Uh, very briefly, the, the most recent budget uh, set out uh, the largest level of investment, 1.2 billion investment in cilantro care initiatives uh, in, in the budget. And that sets out a whole variety of different initiatives that Minister Donnelly and the government are pursuing to deliver on cilantro care and to improve uh, health care for citizens in Ireland. I'll just touch on, on very briefly uh, some of those at the moment. Just to recap then in terms of, of progress in 21, and I guess to highlight two critical elements here, the, 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 the objective to ensure that we can treat people at home. So a very significant uh, increase in the number of home support hours, 17% increase in 21, uh, over 3 million additional hours uh, provided to people to enable them to, to stay at home and get that necessary support uh, at home. And that's a key aspect of, of, of Slaunch Care and what we're trying to do. Secondly then, the move to, to provide care, primary care centres in the community. So nine new primary care centres were, were established uh, last year and there are 29 community health uh, networks and the plan is to, to roll out and complete the community health care networks uh, by, by, the end of, by, by, by the end of this year into, into next year. So again, a very significant shift to the left uh, where there's more resources and more, more infrastructure capacity teams being established and as part of that there's a whole variety of different issues in relation to access by the GP to the, the disease, chronic disease management, the various health uh, hubs and so on that have been established. Also then, the capacity issue, which I mentioned at the start, because a key aspect of Slaunch Care is to enhance the capacity of the system. So various matrix can be used here, uh, and I'll just set out on the slide a few of them, the increase in the number of staff, over 6,000 staff, additional critical care beds, and of course the increase in acute, acute beds. So as I mentioned, the largest increase uh, in capacity of the public health system uh, that we've ever had. Ever had. So you know, in terms of what Slaunch Care is about, these are clear, tangible deliveries and things that the government has been in a position to deliver in the midst of what was the, the, the greatest public health emergency uh, uh, in, a, in 100 years. So I think that shows the intent uh, and the ability to ramp up capacity and address uh, the challenge of Slaunch of Care uh, while uh, preparing for the next stage of reform. So just, uh, just very briefly then, uh, in terms of some initiatives for, for, for this year and, and for next year uh, to focus on very, very quickly again, the continuation of the rollout of the healthcare networks and the community specialist teams uh, and the Fraley teams and all the initiatives at community level uh, and related to that of course a very significant uh, increase in staffing and changes in the pathways, the way in which uh, people are treated uh, to ensure that they're treated in a more efficient way and kept out of the hospital system and avoid the, the choke points that exist uh, within the system. A key uh, element of the improvement in infrastructure is the development of elective only hospitals. So the government has approved now plans for hospitals for Dublin, uh, Galway and Cork, which be elective only hospitals. Uh, and it's estimated that by the end of this decade, these hospitals could treat upwards of a million uh, patients a year, just in, in, in terms of elective only uh, day case uh, procedures uh, for people. And that would free up capacity within the acute system, free up beds and theatre capacity, other capacity uh, to enable other aspects of healthcare to be delivered. A very significant change in how the system is designed uh, and reconfigured, an increase in capacity, but also a great opportunity to redesign uh, the role and functions of, of, of different hospitals. As I mentioned, uh, further improvements in terms of acute capacity and adding to uh, acute beds and changes also in terms of, of how those beds are used and focusing on improving the efficiency and productivity uh, of, that, of that new infrastructure that's coming on, on stream. Also, I'll mention three, three, other, three other issues. Uh, this year, the government is committed to implementing the public owned consultant contract. Uh, and this is a contract uh, which will increase the, the proposed salary uh, of the new, new contract, uh, focusing on public only patients and start the process uh, of, of, of moving uh, private patients out of the public uh, uh, 
uh, public system. Uh, and there have been engagements with the representative bodies and, and there's hope for, for further discussions uh, on how this, this absolutely essential contract can be implemented uh, to deliver on Slauncha Care and ensure that consultants are focused, uh, new consultants are focused on treating public patients in, 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 in public settings. Key issue, of course, is, is, is waiting lists. Uh, and the next few weeks, uh, the government will be uh, publishing uh, the waiting list plan, uh, which sets out, builds on the plan uh, that was devised uh, before at the end of last year uh, to address waiting lists, but now to look at the backlog that's arisen uh, due, to, due to COVID and really tries to uh, address those waiting lists in a very significant way by ramping up uh, activity uh, very significantly. And as I mentioned at the start, there's a stock of people who are, who are waiting and each year there are a large addition so the system needs to increase capacity and increase activity in order to, uh, to, to reduce the, the stock of people waiting and, of course, address the, the numbers of new people who are coming on stream. And finally then, uh, and this again was mentioned to the, the, the earlier speaker, the need to move to population-based uh, healthcare and budgeting uh, and to ensure that resources are allocated to the needs of citizens in different geographical areas. And the government has uh, decided that the six new uh, geographical areas and there'll be integration between the healthcare groups uh, and, and uh, healthcare provided are community based. And the six uh, regional healthcare areas, uh, as I said, the government has agreed the, the, the geographical entities uh, and these will be implemented, uh, start to be implemented during the course uh, of this year and to next. And that will involve a very significant change uh, in the integration between the different settings within healthcare and how budgets are set. Budgets will be set uh, on a regional basis with allocations. Uh, per individual in, in, in different areas. So this sets out a, a snapshot uh, of, of hopefully uh, what we're trying to achieve, what we've been achieving, uh, and what the plans are uh, for this year and next year. So a very exciting agenda, a very necessary agenda, but a very exciting agenda of reform and change to deliver uh, better healthcare uh, for people. And as part of this, the Department of Health and the HSC uh, are now fully committed and behind this reform, working with the various partners to ensure that we can make this a reality and that we can deliver the health system uh, that our citizens uh, want and deserve. So thank you very much. I'll finish up on that note.